Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the fourth lecture of the 2012 Food for Thought Luncheon Lecture Series. I'm Mary Kay Cooper, Director of Alumni Relations. This series is sponsored by the San Antonio Alumni Chapter and coordinated by the Alumni Office. The series is designed to spotlight Trinity's outstanding faculty. Before we get to today's talk, I would like to tell you about an upcoming event. Robin B. Wright, reporter and author, will present Rock the Casbah, Rage and Rebellion Across the Islamic World at 7 p.m. Thursday, April 19, in Laurie Auditorium. Her free public presentation is part of Trinity University's Maverick Lecture. Seating is on a first-come, first-seated basis. Tickets nor reservations are required. We are pleased to have several special Trinity people with us today, and I want you to be able to recognize them. Two of them are Penelope Harley. <laughs> and Vice President for Faculty and Student Affairs, Michael Fisher. I want to remind everyone that this program is being recorded so that people all over the world can view or listen to it later. So during the question and answer period, please come to the microphone to ask your question. Thank you. Derek Rogers, class of 1992, will introduce today's speaker. Derek is a director on the San Antonio Alumni Board, plus he is an attorney with Davis, Cedillo, and Mendoza. Derek? And with an introduction that reminds us all that we are being viewed all around the world, <laughs> let me go ahead and just uh, jump right into it and introduce today Dr. Peter O'Brien, who's a professor of political science here at Trinity University. He is the author of European Perceptions of Islam and America, as well as the Beyond the Swastika, a study of the impact of the legacy of the Holocaust on post-war German immigration policy. He has published many articles on the subject of the presence of Islam in Europe, uh, including Making Normative Sense of the Headscarf Debate in Europe, as well as Islamic Civilizations in a Western Modernity in Comparative uh, Civilizations Review. He earned his PhD from the, uh, in political science from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He has been a, a Social Science Research Council Fellow at the Free University of Berlin, as well as a Fulbright Visiting Professor at Bosporus University in Istanbul and at the Humboldt University in Berlin. And without further ado, Dr. Peter O'Brien. Thank you, Derek, for that uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, thank all of you for the honor and the privilege to share my uh, research with you. And I look forward to your questions and your comments. A large scale post war immigration has left Europe with approximately 20 million Muslim residents. Needless to say, they concentrate in some places more than others, especially in large cities. If you have heard about Islam in Europe, it is likely in conjunction with images like this that evoke an unassimilated population of Muslims living in Europe according to very foreign norms and values. You may have uh, even heard claims that they are gradually transforming the continent into what Bat Yor has sensationally called Eurabia. No few books have reached pop, uh, European bestseller lists portending this fate for Europe. They all take a page from the influential book, The Clash of Civilizations, whose neoconservative author, Harvard political scientist Samuel Huntington, postulated an unbridgeable divide between the values of Western and Islamic civilization. I challenge this reading. I contend that Europe's Muslims are assimilating. However, I add an unexpected twist. 
I maintain that assimilation theory wrongly presumes a unified Europe in which a single lifestyle prevails, which Muslims are supposed to either emulate or remain forever aliens in their new homelands. I argue that Europe has long been and remains profoundly fractured into differing and competing lifestyles or visions of the good life. To quote the title of the book I am currently writing, I postulate clashes within Western civilization and seek to show that European Muslims are adapting to and adopting these differing worldviews common in Europe. Now, because I'm a political scientist, I take particular interest in political worldviews, or what I call public philosophies. I understand a public philosophy to be a loosely integrated vision based on presuppositions of how politics ought ideally to work. I argue that three vying public philosophies predominate in contemporary European politics. I call these liberalism, nationalism, and postmodernism. For reasons I cannot take the time to treat during the talk, but can in the Q&A, the three that either inform, absorb, or crowd out a host of other isms, socialism, feminism, uh, racism, that may readily come to your mind. Today, I would like to adumbrate the tenets of each, liberalism, nationalism, and postmodernism, as well as briefly suggest the ways that European Muslims incorporate these various outlooks into their political endeavors. By liberalism, I do not mean the political ideology of Obama, Clinton, and Kennedy. Rather, I have in mind the lofty ideals enunciated during the European Enlightenment of the 17th and 18th centuries by such luminaries as Voltaire and John Locke and Immanuel Kant. These include that all persons are created equal. A critical dimension of their equality is the ability to reason, to think for themselves. As a result, all adult persons should enjoy individual autonomy or the liberty to lead their lives as they see fit as long as they don't impede on somebody else doing the same. Furthermore, the best way to guarantee equality and liberty for all is through a government of rational, fair laws based on the consent of the governed, in a word, democracy. Most importantly, these aforementioned principles are universally valid and applicable to all persons in all times, all places, no exceptions. Liberal theory tends to swing between a voluntarist and a perfectionist pole. Liberal voluntarism seeks to limit government to removing primarily the physical obstacles to freedom, optimistically postulating that free persons, because they are rational, will embrace universal liberal values. More pessimistic in orientation, liberal perfectionism discerns powerful, insidious, often psychic forces arrayed against individual freedom, such as the internalization of ignorance and superstition as a result of accumulated centuries of indoctrination. Government should take the offensive for an otherwise beleaguered liberalism by debunking the myths and illusions of obscuritanist thinking and by educating and socializing its citizens, especially its youth, to respect the liberal values of equality liberty, tolerance, and democracy. As sad as it may be, some people need to be forced to be free. <laughs> Consider, for example, the ban on certain forms of Islamic dress, the burqa anywhere in public in Belgium and France, or the headscarf in all public schools in fr France and Turkey, public school teachers only in Germany, judges, for instance, in the Netherlands and Denmark. Many Muslims support banning the veil, or what's called the hijab. The most high-profile proponents tend to be Muslim women like Ayan Hirsi Ali, the Dutch author of The Caged Virgin. They claim to speak from experience, having grown up Muslim and having been subjected themselves to veiling, or worse, in Hirsi Ali's case, forced marriage at the age of 15 and genital mutilation. They insist that women and girls who claim to cover freely should not be taken seriously, for they are the victims of relentless familial, 
clerical, and peer pressure, not to mention centuries of blinkered religious dogma threatening that going out in public uncovered invites the wrath of God and eternal damnation. The ban forces Muslim women and girls to experience authentic freedom, for which they will, once they're exposed to a liberal education, one day surely be grateful, just as Hersey Ali is. Relatedly, because the hijab serves as a symbol of the oppression of women, governments truly dedicated to gender equality have no business allowing state employees to propagate its illiberal message on government time and euro. Muslim opponents of prescribing veiling argue that the ban goes too far and invades freedom of religion and expression. Forward, forced veiling is wrong and should not be tolerated, but so is forced unveiling. The best way to avoid either wrong is to permit both covering and uncovering. Let the individual woman or girl decide herself. After all, Many Muslim females freely elect to cover as an expression of sincere piety. Indeed, in a secularized European milieu where covering continues to generate widespread stigmatization, veiled girls and women ought to be celebrated as paragons of nonconformity and courageous self-determination. These views on veiling reflect two broader both liberal but nonetheless distinguishable approaches to being Muslim in secular Europe. Perfectionists like Hersey Ali admonish the state, particularly through its public education system, to subject Islamic doctrine to rational criticism. They are convinced that under such scrutiny the practice of Islam will be found incompatible with democracy. They are best understood really as anti-Islamic ex-Muslims who want to employ the resources of the European secular state to secularize or de-Islamize Muslims. That is to educate them away from their creed over to a modern rational outlook on life. They feel that the vast majority of Europeans have been liberated from the clutches of ecclesiastical authority through the process of widespread and deeply penetrating secularization and they are committed to making sure that their Muslim brethren now residing in Europe do not miss this opportunity to experience progress and enlightenment. I read liberal voluntarism into what is popularly referred to as Euro-Islam. Advocates of Euro-Islam, like the German political scientist Bassam Tibi, aver that Islam is no less compatible with secularism and democracy than Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. Like those two, Protestantism through the Reformation and Roman Catholicism later via Vatican II, Islamic doctrine and practice must be scrutinized and purged of medieval accretions which conflict with the predominant norms of modern life in Europe, such things as polygamy or eye-for-eye -eye justice. And there is no better uh, there's no one better to carry this out than uh, European Muslims, precisely because they reside in Europe where they can readily emulate the examples of Christianity. The 20, this 21st century, uh, it's kind of called a reformation for Islam, will entail many facets, but the most important will be to excise all the theocratic ambitions to use government to impose Islamic law and values throughout society. This depolitization amounts to limiting Islam to one's private creed, nothing more. This demands in turn toleration of all Muslims, not merely co-Abrahamic Christians and Jews as stipulated in the Quran. Rather than be shorn to nothing when fully exposed to the razor of modern reason, a Euro-Islam, argue its defenders, will be left with a core of sacred values such as universal brotherly love and respect, concern for the unfortunate, human humility and atonement that all great religions share. Euro-Islam holds out the bright prospect for an updated form of Islamic religiosity that can make pious Muslims proud and comfortable co-inhabitants of a modern secular Europe. 
Nationalism emerged in the 18th and 19th century Europe as both a philosophical and political movement in direct opposition to, universal, uh, to liberal universalism. As Napoleon marched across Europe in the name of spreading Enlightenment ideals, many non-Frenchmen and even some Frenchmen viewed the self-declared emperor's aggression as bald expansionism. They sought, therefore, to debunk his proclaimed ideals of egalité, liberté, and fraternité for everyone. A number of sharp minds, such as Johann Gottfried Herder, Edmund Burke, and Joseph de Maistre, took aim at the central enlightenment presumption of a universal human nature, and with it, the idea of universally valid and applicable principles and laws. Humans, they argue, are always products of, the, of their particular context, be they historical, environmental, or cultural. Because the contexts are neither identical nor chosen, humans cannot share a universal essence or nature. They are insurmountably particular. Each nation, Herder, for instance, argued, has a unique soul. This essence defines not only the nation, but its individual members as well, who fulfill themselves only as members of this collective nation. They experience life as a collective we, right, rather than an independent uh, I postulated by liberalism. Think for a moment about language. They always focused on language. You can only know yourself through your particular language, right? I'm Peter, not Pietro, not Pe Pedro. Moreover, my language through which I understand everything has no meaning if not shared with others like you who speak it. Linguistic nations, like other nations, therefore, experience the world not only differently from one another, but collectively. Burke expressed the idea of a nation perhaps most eloquently as an ongoing and quasi-sacred pact or partnership between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are yet to be born, to honor the nation's achievements of the past, enrich those of the present, and make possible those of the future. Because each nation is unique, it alone can determine collectively what is best for it. It follows then that every nation deserves a government or nation state of its own, whose primary purpose then lies in protecting and advancing the interests and the identity of its uh, people, its nation. Attesting to the extraordinary sway of the idea of nationalism, nation states first arose in Europe and then in good time across the rest of the globe, destroying every last multinational <laughs> empire in existence. As with liberalism, I emphasize two strands of nationalism, xenophobic and egalitarian. The former views the world as finite, without enough space for each nation to have its own territory and state. Nations therefore stand in competition with one another, making the nation states utmost priority, defending the national community from inevitable encroachments from other nations or peoples. Egalitarian nationalism preaches that because it is in fact impossible in a finite world to grant each nation its own state and territory, the proper role of government needs to be redefined. That uh, the state should rather ensure that all nations or peoples within its borders are afforded the opportunity to survive and thrive as a nation, that is, as a collective we. In the age of migration that scatters human beings across the globe into ethnic, religious, uh, you know, and other minority communities in far off lands, egalitarian nationalism has earned a new epithet of communitarianism. Its creed, however, remains unchanged. No bona fide community or diaspora of persons who share a collective identity in history, sometimes called communities of destiny, should have to endure the unacceptable sacrifice of losing that identity simply because its members have to leave their homeland. 
Communitarianism rests on the principle of, or the moral principle of, of the presumed, uh, of the presumption, sorry, of equal worth, the presumption of equal worth. What does that mean? Each separate community has to be presumed to understand best the rationale for its own internal workings. No outsider, not even government, should presume to tell a community how to run its own affairs. Xenophobic nationalism obviously affects Muslims in the form of Islamophobic parties, which lament that large-scale immigration of Muslims threatens our way of life, an important part of which involves the Christian heritage of the land and people. Now, though rabid xenophobes, like Jean-Marie Le Pen's Front National in France, call for the deportation of Muslims, most moderate xenophobic nationalists contend that Muslims are welcome on condition that they assimilate to the dominant culture, learn its language, adopt its customs and mores, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Truth be told, many Muslims are doing just that. I use the label waning Muslims to distinguish them from the zealously anti-Islamic ex-Muslims for whom having once been a devout Muslim remains critical to their identity, even if in the sense of what they abhor. The waning Muslim tends to be largely indifferent toward Islam. You have probably all met the immigrant who does not appear to lose much sleep over the fact that her children uh, no longer speak the language of their parents or grandparents. It's considered you know, either inevitable or even sometimes a good thing in a country where English is the dominant language. Well, this is essentially the way the waning Muslim feels towards Islam. She rather matter-of-factly recognizes that, a, that in a historically Christian land, the opportunities to practice Islam will be fewer and more inconvenient. She may hail from a family in the sending country that hasn't been particularly religious in the first place. So it's not that big of a deal if she loses contact to Islam. <clears throat> she takes no umbrage, for instance, at the fact that practically the entire school and work schedule is organized around Christian holidays. She and her family might even celebrate Christmas and Easter. She doesn't shrink from sending her children to the best school just because it is one of Europe's thousands of state-subsidized Christian schools. She stirs up no row, a row when her child decides to marry a Christian or baptize her grandchild. And she might even convert to Christianity. In many cases, of course, out of sincere conviction, but in others, out of the desire to make an interfaith marriage work more smoothly. Politically speaking, waning Muslims take greatest interest in anti-discrimination legislation mandated by the European Union in 2000 for all its member states. Since waning Muslims tend to feel totally French, totally British, etc., Practically nothing raises their ire more than to be turned down for a mortgage, passed over for a job, denied citizenship because they happen to have a Muslim name or countenance. Communitarian Muslims, by contrast, live in dread of straying from Islam. They endeavor, despite residing in Europe long term, to practice Islam in a way that is as close as possible to the way it is practiced in the homeland. They typically import imams from the homeland to run their community mosque. They seek whenever possible to send their children to Islamic private schools or to after-school Quran classes. They arrange for their children to marry a good Muslim from back home. What is most important from my analysis is that communitarian Muslims petition the European state for the same kind of support that most European governments pr provide to Christian and Jewish organizations. I'm thinking here of tax breaks, state subsidies for private parochial schools, religious education in public schools, which is common in Europe. Uh, now, moreover, employing the presumption of equal worth argument, they insist that they should receive such assistance even when their beliefs and practices offend the sensibilities of the majority population. Thus, they request to, uh, exemptions to slaughter and prepare meat according to Islamic ritual, halal, 
despite the outcries of animal rights activists who find it cruel. They demand to write Islamic curricula and control who teaches Islamic religious education, even though critics charge that they propagate anti-democratic views. To return to our headscarf debate, they petition for support of Islamic organizations that mandate veiling. Non-Muslims cannot possibly appreciate the imperative of veiling. To make it a voluntary choice is already to sin because God did not leave it to choice. Such demands have often proved persuasive to European officials who are deeply influenced by the tradition of nationalist political philosophy. In countries such as Sweden, the Netherlands, and the UK, which have formal policies of multiculturalism, state subsidies regularly flow to Islamic organizations whose female members must wear the hijab. In Germany, halal butchering has been legal since 2003. In 2007, Britain established the Muslim Arbitration Tribunal, which adjudicates mainly probate, divorce, and custody cases, but according to Sharia Islamic law. I want to italicize two points regarding communitarians to distinguish them from postmodern Muslims, and then I'll turn to the postmodern Muslims. First, communitarians seek not only government assistance, but approval. They are law abiding. They desire laws rooted in a society uh, that has a consensus based on the presumption of equal worth. Second, they do not aspire to proselytize outside their own community, that is, they do not seek to change the majority culture. They merely want government assistance to maintain their faith as they see fit among themselves so that it does not become yet another casualty of global homogenization. Postmodern Muslims do aspire to effect change throughout society. To understand why they conclude that they should and must do so, I need to outline some tenets of postmodernism that inform their thought and action. Postmodern thought utterly rejects the idea and the ideal of genuine or lasting consensus. Whether postulated in a universal moral ethic, as in liberalism, or a shared national homogeneous identity, as in nationalism, consensus, they argue, always represents a morally and politically convenient illusion. All of the seminal postmodern savants, first and foremost Friedrich Nietzsche, but also Maurice Merleau-Ponty, Ludwig Wittgenstein, Martin Heidegger, adamantly contended that truth is made rather than discovered. What the vast majority of human beings take as absolute truth is nothing more than a human and always biased construction that is made to pass for objective truth. Perhaps cleverly, but it's made to pass for collective truth. All grand illusions are made to pass for truth because they are propagated by a vast, intricate network of political powers, economic resources, academic uh, validations, and institutional normalizations, what postmodern jargon calls a discourse that foists itself, uh, or its truth claim, that is, on human beings overwhelmed by its sway. Perhaps many of you have read George Orwell's 1984, arguably the most arresting account of the power of illusion. The evil man is called O'Brien, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> well, postmodernists see our reality as not so far removed from Orwell's fiction. Dissidents, like the protagonist Winston, right, who resist the illusion passed off as truth wind up being stigmatized as abnormal, what postmodernists call the invented negative other, the them, right? That in turn projects back a positive image of the normal self, us, 
the ones who live the illusion as truth. But because truths and the consensus or the identity that they engender are actually constructed and imposed ultimately through political power and maneuvering, they can be disrupted by the political resistance of those demonized as the negative other. In fact, argue postmodernists, this is the ultimate fate of all convenient illusions, however firmly they might be entrenched at a given time. The negative other trope is one of the most frequently deployed arguments in the politics of immigration. It has become a virtual mantra for post or pro-Muslim sorry, advocates. Muslims are Europe's new Jews, its latest persecuted, persecuted minority whom Europeans love to hate. Common to is the post-colonial argument. The widespread discrimination and exploitation of Muslims in Europe represents a thinly veiled continuation of relations of domination that stretch back to the era of European colonialism, in fact, even to the Crusades. Indeed, the first instances of forced unveiling by French authorities took place in French Algeria in the 19th century. Furthermore, the popular images of Muslims as backward, anti-democratic, misogynistic, prone to violence extremists that daily circulate throughout mainstream Western media, they so obviously imply or project back a self-servingly positive image of Europeans as modern, rational, pacific, and democratic that a junior high school student could craft a persuasive postmodern analysis of them. Take the media frenzy surrounding the incidents of so-called honor killings, when Muslim men sway their wife, uh, slay, sorry, their wife, daughter, or sister, <coughs> purportedly because she has punctured the family's honor by sexually consorting with non-Muslims. Discussion of the case of Haitun Sujuju dominated German media for well over a year and led to passage of a special act of parliament. The overblown preoccupation with such cases, a mere handful of which occur annually, all too conveniently distracts attention away from the fact that violence against women is rampant and largely unpunished among non-Muslim Europeans at every single social level. The same holds for the obsession with so-called Islamic terrorism, not merely in the media, but also among state security agents. Such religious and racial profiling obscures the fact that Europe has long spawned its own Christian terrorists, such as the IRA, or more recently the mass murderer Anders Bering Breivik in Norway. Now some Muslims argue that such popular images are patently false and manifest hypocrisy on the part of non-Muslims who condone a double standard of treating Muslims unequally. Insofar as they demand equality for Muslims, they operate within the moral orbit of the liberal public philosophy. The postmodern perspective comes into play among Muslims who contend that non-Muslim governments will not and cannot treat Muslims fairly. The power, privilege, and even the identity of non-Muslim Europeans are so wrapped up in the demonization and the domination of Muslims that it is, to, it is simply naive to think that they will ever cease fire. The prudent postmodern conclusion to draw then is dominate or be dominated. There's just no other alternative. This position is frequently advanced by Islamists, by which I simply mean Muslim political activists who aspire to install Islamic governments that enact Islamic law as they interpret it from the Quran and other sacred sources. Now all but the tiniest lunatic fringe considers even remotely possible the actual usurpation of secular European governments. But informed by the postmodern dismissal of the possibility of impartial 
or fair governing. Islamists urge their followers to carve out zones of relative autonomy for their Islamic lifestyles and even if this means breaking the law. Oversimplifying a bit to be sure here, they seek to establish pockets or niches where Islamic law and practice prevail over and against secular law, if need be. Such de facto zones of Islamist autonomy often do not extend beyond the walls of an abode or the doors of a mosque, but sometimes they do envelop an entire neighborhood or district of town. In such areas, uh, men take multiple wives, women who dress immodestly are regularly harassed, children are taught that Islamic values are superior to the secular ones forced down their throats in public schools. Islamists often invert the negative other image right, by depicting all Westerners and the whole of Western society as ungodly, hedonistic, promiscuous, depraved, vicious, and sadistic. This fight the power message appeals to alienated, chronically unemployed youth and often turns up in Muslim hip hop music such as the French group Sniper. Now in contrast to communitarians, those I'm calling postmodern Islamists rest content neither with waiting for government approbation nor with confining their strivings to the Muslim community. They seek to extend their zones of influence, including to non-Muslims. They have sought to prevent productions that depict Islam insultingly, such as the case of the Deutsche Oper's decision to cancel its stagings of uh, Mozart's Idomeneo in Berlin in 2006 out of fear of Muslim reprisals or Islamist reprisals. You perhaps remember the Danish cartoon controversy of 2005 and the protests against the newspaper Jilans Posten, which published the mocking images of the Prophet Muhammad. And you surely remember the uproar over Salman Rushdie's sat satanic verses in 1989 because he was just here. The organization uh, Muslim Parliament UK, based in London, not in Tehran, based in London, audaciously announced that it intended to carry out on British soil the fatwa, the fatwa calling for Rushdie's execution. In 2004, Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh was stabbed to death while cycling home in Amsterdam, though it appears to have been by a lone fundamentalist enraged by van Gogh's film, Submission, which opens with verses of the Quran tattooed on a naked woman. Now I would be remiss if I did not mention coordinated and successful acts of Islamist motivated terrorism. Some of the 9-11 perpetrators were trained at the Al-Quds Mosque in Hamburg. And the 7-7 London 2 bombers were not smuggled in from Afghanistan, but were British citizens. Hardline postmodernists regret such degeneration of political difference into violence, but warn that no one can devise a foolproof recipe to prevent it in a world that is permeated by postmodern cynicism and relativism. But don't let me leave you with this dog eat dog reading of postmodernism, for there exists a kinder, gentler interpretation that I dub hospitable postmodernism. Hospitable postmodernism also offers no guarantee of harmony, neutrality, certainty, or stability, but it refuses to jettison the possibility that rival parties adhering to fundamentally different world views can learn to interact with one another via mutually respectful and beneficial practices. It stresses hybridity by which is meant the unconventional and unexpected intersecting of identities and values 
that produces such increasingly common hybrid personalities as, say, the, the Italian Muslim homosexual. <laughs> Hospitable postmodernism urges us to engage bizarre crisscrossings of differently-minded persons and groups and explore them for solutions, solutions that have yet to be imagined. And they're never going to be imagined <coughs> if people don't engage the bizarreness, as uncomfortable as it might be. To do so, however, we must relax our firm identities and principles and open ourselves to the possibility of hybridity, of becoming or doing something we normally would consider strange and foreign to ourselves. Such solutions, warn hospitable postmodernists even, will always have to be pragmatic, rather than principled, context-specific, rather than uniform, and fragile, rather than form, affirm, sorry, I mean, in need of constant renegotiation. I detect unmistakable, hospitable, postmodern learnings among a younger generation of Islamists that German anthropologist Werner Schiffauer labels post-Islamists. I have in mind here, for instance, Tariq Ramadan, the superstar of the European Muslim Brotherhood movement, by far the best organized and most influential network of Islamist associations in Europe. Ramadan is the grandson of Hassan al-Banna, who founded the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in 1928 and whom Nasser ordered executed in 1949. Tariq's father, Saeed Ramadan, also a prominent Brotherhood leader, was exiled from Egypt and forced to flee with his family to Switzerland. So Tariq grew up among exiled Islamists, but also in the heart of Europe. He graduated from the University of Geneva, writing a PhD, a PhD thesis on no one other than Nietzsche, and is now a professor of Islamic studies at Oxford University. He's a walking, talking hybrid. Like numerous other younger European post-Islamists who have a similar hybrid socialization of living with their feet in two worlds, Ramadan rejects the stark dichotomy of the evil West and virtuous Islam advanced by the generation of his grandfather and father. He lauds in particular the religious freedom and democratic governing in Europe and insists that Islamists have much to learn and profit from both. But, at the same time, he respects many of the incisive critiques of the West, such as of its rampant materialism, its vapid spirituality, <coughs> leveled by the older generation of Islamists. He refuses to dismiss all their ideas for an uncritical, wholesale affirmation of Western life. Post-Islamists want to engage rather than defeat Western society. And they feel fortunate that its democratic institutions make this possible. But they want to engage qua Muslims rather than as assimilated clones. They want to share the treasures of their rich Islamic heritage as sources of ideas that can benefit all Europeans. Muslim and non-Muslim alike. They encourage their non-Muslim interlocutors, whom they routinely invite to ecumenical conferences. They encourage them to explore the unconventional and hybrid possibility that a more Islamic Europe might well be a better Europe. This idea is beautifully, beautifully captured, cleverly captured here, by these young girls, not all young, are they? Uh, these women, of course, wearing the French tricolors of the French flag, but as headscarves. We're for France, but we're Muslims. Let me briefly exemplify the differences in approaches with the controversial issue of whether Muslim adolescents ought to have to take part in co-ed swimming instruction in public schools where revealing bathing suits are worn. Right? This is a real big uh, topic for Muslim 
uh, for many Muslim parents. Okay, so what's the liberal perfectionist position? Force the Muslim girls to swim with all the rest of the students. Huh? That's part of becoming an independent uh, adult, being able to swim and, and everything it, it, it means. Communitarian approach? Exempt the Muslim girls from swimming or have a special class with a pool where there's no one else there uh, but these girls and they swim in the pool. What's the postmodern or the hospitable postmodern approach? Have all boys, Muslim and non Muslim, and all girls, Muslim and non Muslim, take their classes apart, meaning in unisexual classes. What does this do? It says, yes, the girls need to learn how to swim, as liberals demand, rightly demand. But it also says we can learn from Islam, Lamas, exposing impressionable pubescent teenagers to each other's bodies encourages imprudent and unnecessary sexualization of their relationships. Or, there's always the burkini. <laughs> now you must be waiting for me to answer the $64,000 question. What percentage of European Muslims are liberals, nationalists, and postmodernists? I'm sorry, I'm going to have to frustrate you. But the frustration involves revealing the most unexpected and I think the most important conclusion of my research. And that is, in reality, few if any Muslims can be found who fit perfectly into these neat and consistent philosophical boxes that I just outlined. Real people are simply messier and more complicated than the models that social scientists devise to explain their behavior. Muslim Europeans, like non-Muslim Europeans, move quite freely in and out and about liberalism, nationalism, and postmodernism. I urge you to think, particularly uh, here, <laughs> uh, of a kind of, of, of smorgasbord, uh, where all of the six different uh, positions, right, three times two in each, uh, are available there on the smorgasbord. Well, political actors pick and choose myriad combinations that strike them as delicious. Delicious metaphorically meaning, of course, whatever helps them to, to sound better in a particular audience, successfully work uh, a particular point, or deftly deflect the latest criticism, in a word, uh, to play the political game and to play it well. Now, you, you might be thinking, well, come on, what about a Hersey Alley, for instance? She's got to be a per, you know, pure liberal perfectionist. But not really, because she deliberately uses the distortion of Muslims uh, to push her agenda and particularly to sell her books. Islamists often will petition the state, even while they're breaking the law, they petition the state to have the law changed, and if it is changed, then they move over to the communitarian position, say thank you for your support, thank you for legalizing the practice. And I've already mentioned how the post-Islamists uh, warm to liberal freedom and democracy. So this smorgasbord approach to politics reflects what Charles Taylor has diagnosed as mutual fragilization, a prevailing condition of the contemporary age. In a plural society, we become so frequently exposed to beliefs at odds with our own that confidence in our own values erodes or becomes fragile, whether we realize it or not. Although self-doubt can move some to stubbornly defend and zealously advance their principles, you know, my way or no way, a lot of us wind up relaxing and compromising our cherished principles in the name of simply getting on. Now doing so surely will strike the trained philosopher or moralist as blatantly inconsistent, both philosophically and morally. But then again, a philosophically and morally inconsistent lifestyle might just prove a cleverer strategy 
for negotiating the challenges of a world turned so profoundly multicultural by immigration and globalization. Try it. You might like it. <laughs> so I welcome your questions, your comments. And they did ask you to use the microphone so it gets on tape. I can be free if I use this. I guess people are taking a little a pause to come to the microphone and I'm taking that advantage. I'm Salim Shuri from the Alumni Relations Office at Trinity University. Uh, I could not thank you more for what you just presented. I have had the opportunity to hear great scholars like you in the name of John Espesido. Uh, many of you are familiar with his readings and he is one of many of like Peter O'Brien who challenged the readings and thesis of Samuel Huntington, who provided the fuel, necessary fuel, for all the xenophobics that you explained in this world, and particularly to the point where, right after the Cold War, we needed a common enemy for us to survive. And sure enough, we found Islam. And that's why we are. But wonderful, wonderful, study that you provided us that helped us understand all sides and to take the side, whatever we choose, and that's the way you concluded. Um, the way I have grown up to this point, I tend to be falling in the communitarian box yeah. that you have described. Is it easy or hard to do in the United States? Yes, and uh, exactly. And with that mindset, <laughs> With that mindset, yesterday, if some of you have attended John um, um, Huntsman's lecture at the Policymakers Breakfast, in his wonderful, <coughs> wonderful speech, at one point he had a predictions of the, towards the end of the 21st century. And he first said, the rise of Islam. And I kept wondering, and today I found an academician who has wonderful research do you see, if you believe in his predictions, do you see the possibility of the rise of a new horizon of cooperation among the believers of Abrahamic thoughts, and especially among the major religions? Is that the possibility that we can live up to that far? Over to you. Thank you. Nice question. Big question. <laughs> Social scientists should never try to predict anything. I once said, uh, my father came to Berlin in 1988, and I was there, and he, Peter, you think this damn wall will ever come down? I'm a political scientist, especially in Germany. No, Dad, certainly not in your life. No. <laughs> <laughs> Called me, just laughing, in <laughs> November of 1989. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I expect this same kind of political and philosophical and religious pluralism to, uh, to continue. Now, and part of that will be efforts at bringing together people uh, of maybe all faiths, not just the Abrahamic ones, but there's a lot of work being done uh, in serious places. Um, Oxford University, for instance, uh, excuse me, Cambridge University just has a new chair in, new institute and two chairs, sorry, endowed chairs in um, the economical relations between uh, uh, Islam, Christianity, and, and, and Judaism. Uh, these things, they, they exist. So there are people out there working on it, writing really interesting stuff. Re, it takes a lot of rethinking because Islam was considered to be, you know, really in some ways, uh, Western Europe in particular was defined against Islam as the, as the enemy. 
Uh, and so seeing, like my book, Perception, you know, European Perceptions of Islam uh, and, and America, uh, one, one right-wing critic uh, wrote, you know, O'Brien uh, outlandishly argues that uh, Islam has been uh, a critical part in the development of European identity or something like that. You know, so there are people out there who don't want to recognize the crisscrossings when they're, where they weren't supposed to happen. But of course, they did happen in, in wonderful flowering places like uh, the Iberian Peninsula before 1492. So there's work being done. And you saw there with my post-Islamists, right? They have lots of, of these uh, conferences where they talk these things through uh, and they invite people from uh, all faiths. So be hopeful. But I don't think you'll, you'll get the... You, know, you won't be that that position won't be the hegemonic one, I don't think. Hi. Hello. I am Dwight Lee. I'm a businessman in San Antonio. Thanks for coming. I'm, I'm almost eighty years old. They don't look it. Thank you. After nine eleven, I began to study Islam. I'm familiar with the Quran, the Hadith, the Sunnah, the Tasfir, the uh, reliance of the traveler. Read the uh, what's considered by the Muslims to be the most accurate biography of the Bible, that which was written by Ibn Ishaq in I think the year 730. I'm really puzzled. As I read the Holy Writ, there is a requirement, particularly in Surah 9 and 5, there is a requirement for violence. Kill the Jews, kill the Christians. That in black and white is seemingly pretty specific. How do we reconcile the Holy Writ requirements of the 19 participants in 9-11? 19 were Muslim. Mm -hmm. They were not terrorists. They were devout Muslims. They were doing exactly what they were required. <laughs> How do we reconcile these two irreconcilable requirements? Yeah, good question. Uh, Frank, I saw you come in there. Um, uh, can you give me the verb in the Old Testament where they, they're supposed to go out and kill? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know it. Frank's going to, he'll be able to tell you exactly where it is. Since you so nicely pointed right to five and nine, uh, I'm sure he will be able to point to it. But, uh, for, for the benefit of the tape and people who don't know me, uh, I was uh, I'm an emeritus professor uh, here at Trinity, having taught mostly Old Testament studies, but also way back when world religions and Islam uh, and Judaism. For, uh, I was here for 40 years. Uh, that's a very interesting comment because as Peter is saying, and I'm going to take this to a comment I was going to make about what you said here. Uh, any religious tradition, particularly the Christian and Jewish traditions, have to deal with problems of things that sit in their scripture. And of course, as you know, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism are scripture centered in a way that other religions are not. Things that sit there that are awful, genocide, or the, the command to genocide. The book of Joshua in the Old Testament, if read with attention to what the book says and not to the few little clumps that, that <laughs> priests and ministers tend to pick out of it, is a book that counsels genocide the way in which the people of Israel are to occupy the promised land is by killing the Canaanites, 
their women, their children, in one or two particular patients, their cattle. Don't leave anything alive. And then you can inherit, again quoting from the book of Joshua, I can't give you a chapter and verse. Mm. Uh, you can inherit the vineyards that you did not plant and the houses that you did not build after you exterminate that Canaanite scum that inhabits it. Now, again, for those who do not know me, uh, I'm one of those postmodern guys. Uh, and I came to my postmodern hermeneutical views. I've, I've just reviewed this because uh, I have just finished writing an article for Oxford University Press. They're doing an encyclopedia of biblical interpretation. And guess what I'm doing? Or I just did. The article on Cuban diaspora interpreters, of whom there are you know, half a dozen of them. And guess what? Our experience of being hybrid, hyphenated Americans, life in, on the hyphen, as, as the Cuban author says, that's what taught me that the, you know, the way to deal with interpreting the Bible and with interpreting most things is this postmodern way of seeing the constructed nature of most of what we do. The positivist view that says, for example, the Bible says, kill the Canaanites. Oh, here's the Canaanite. What? <laughs> of course, our moral sense rejects it. And when we realize that not only does the Bible contradict that, and the Quran abundantly contradicts in other places those genocidal injunctions. But that when you try to get into the conditions under which those words were written in both Bible and Quran, you find that they are constructions of a particular time the Muhammad or the writer of Joshua was facing a particular political situation and reacted, I must say, in a double way. <laughs> now, if you have the obstacle, or no, let me be consistent. If you have the construction that this is the word of God, well, you wind up getting a whole lot of commandments that contradict each other, some of which you morally reject, and you have the problem in which we find ourselves. So what can we do? My friend, and I'll, I'll finish with this, my friend, uh, Fernando Segovia at Vanderbilt, another Cuban, says that we construct, and, and, and very much of a, of a uh, you know, in, in, in the same uh, uh, boat as, as me. He, he says we must construct a hermeneutic of otherness and engagement. In other words, recognize, to use a phrase back from the, from the 60s, where we're coming from, and, and that's, that's a big step for most of us. And also recognize where the other is coming from. And then engage, which is what I think you're, you're, you're saying. I love Martin Marty's book, uh, When Phase Collide. He talks about risky hospitality. Yeah. You have to invite people over to your house and you cannot be uh, just convinced that they are not going to hate what you serve. Yeah. That they're not maybe going to say, why do you have that picture on your wall? That's insulting to me. But you've got to take the risk. That's a very thumbnail sketch of a good yeah. book by Chicago. And, and we can't ever stop doing that, is the other thing. You chose Joshua. How many thousands of years ago was And as you identified, it was for a very specific time and place. Yeah, correct. The New Testament says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you. So in the Quran, we have what we call the doctrine of abrogation, or progressive illumination. Mm -hmm. 
The interesting thing is, though, the requirements for violence are after the requirements for peace. But I encourage each one of you to do what I do. You could, you should dismiss. Go get the book. Read it yourself. Don't take my word for it. Read it yourself. There is an incredible amount of literature out there. Make your own decision. Two comments. Number one, and you're absolutely correct, the great deconstructor in the New Testament kept saying, you have heard that it was said, but I say unto you, that was Jesus. He was, he was deconstructing, that's a good postmodern word, some of the laws and the interpretations and, and so on that were there in the Jewish scripture, which was his scripture, of course. The Quran is utterances that come from the life of a prophet who did not see the end result of what he started, even in, in terms of the conquest. Uh, Muhammad, by the end of his life, in what, 632, something like that. Uh, by the end of his life, Muhammad, of course, was a religious ruler of Mecca and the tribes centered around it, but not the ruler of the empire that Islam was quickly going to become with its fast expansion. Everything that he said was said in, in, in a very rushed context where there wasn't the time that was between the the, the book of Joshua and the changes of situation at the time of the New Testament or whatever. So I'd be very careful with trying to evaluate Quranic statements in terms of, uh, you know, development. Literal. Uh, the Quran is written in, in a much shorter time and by one author. And, and, and you know, the, the Bible is a very different situation. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, I think we all had uh, enough food for thought for, uh, at this point, but I do want to remind everybody that we do have our final lecture coming up on May 2nd. Uh, Professor David McPherson from the Department of Economics will speak on current trends in pensions. It'll be a little bit of a departure from this type of a discourse. <laughs> But I think uh, you'll find it equally enthralling. Last <laughs> year, right. if you want to talk, you didn't get a chance to pose your question and make your comment. I'm still here for a good uh, 20 or 30 minutes if you'd like. Thank, Thank you. you all very much. <laughs>